Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation. We're scheduled to begin the presentation at the top of the hour, so we're 30 seconds to a minute away from that. So while we're waiting for that to go ahead and start off, I figured I'd cover a bit of housekeeping issues uh, with you all. So we are recording today's session, so if you're looking for a copy of the recording, keep an eye on your inbox in the days following this event for a link to the recording and some other uh, reference materials that we talk about in this webinar. Also, if you have any questions or comments for either of our presenters today, please feel free to direct them via the question or chat window, and we'll do our best to save some time at the end of the webinar for some a few questions. If for some reason we run a little long and we can't get to everybody's questions, we'll try to follow up with you after the event. So with that being said, thank you for joining us today for today's Migrations Made Easy webinar. We are joined today by uh, Jason E. Smith, uh, and Jack Smith, who are going to uh, take us through the presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and give uh, Jason the, the ball and let him uh, take us through today's presentation. Thanks, Ray. Thank you, Jack, for joining us for this. So Jack is a system engineer with, uh, systems engineer with Liquidware and has put in practice many of the things you'll be learning about today. And really when we talk about migrations made easy, you'll you'll figure out really quick that this is not a traditional migration. We're going to talk about a way that you can move your users over, whether it's from an operating system to an operating system, or from one deployment method or platform for a desktop to another, and have really be able to have your users experience zero user downtime and make your desktops and workspaces much more dynamic. A little bit about Liquidware before we get to the heart of the migration is that we provide adaptive workspace management. It's almost self-explanatory, but really what that means is that your workspaces can dynamically adapt to any other platform, ROS, if you have our suite of solutions in place. And that's the heart of what we're talking about today with our migrations. And we do that with our user environment management, with Profile Unity, being able to dynamically apply the user's environment from one desktop to the next, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> our application layering, known as FlexApp, you can package up apps and have them layer to environments, keeping applications dynamic. Once they're packaged one time, they will follow the user from desktop to desktop, cloud to cloud, OS to OS, without having to repackage those apps. And you can assess and monitor the environment with Stratosphere user experience diagnostics, which will give you decision support for any project going forward, so you can assess for that next desktop and baseline your existing environments and prepare for the move across the next environment. Perhaps do a pilot and to assess, is the desktop indeed better? Is it sized appropriately for your users? How's it performing based um, on how it compares to the old desktop? And then you can troubleshoot and diagnose those desktops so you can grow and scale those desktops and workspaces going forward. And again, these solutions work across virtual, cloud, and physical-based desktops. When we talk about physical desktops, we're talking about any type of Windows desktop, including laptops. There are some nuances for laptops when it comes to keeping your applications portable. So in that case, application layering does have some limitations in there. But for any well-connected desktop, the uh, suite works across all desktops that we'll be discussing today. For whatever reason, I'm uh, having a challenge getting to that next slide. Now it'll probably move two or three at once. <clears throat> Let's talk about briefly, we're going to talk about platform migrations too today, but let's also talk about Windows 7 and the deadline. Most of you experienced this and you're ready 247 days ago when Windows 7 standard support expired. And yes, it has been 247 days, much earlier this year that Windows 7 was its end of life, unless you paid for additional uh, support going forward, special support. And that support was uh, based on individual prices for individual users and would range anywhere from $25 to $50. Again, Ray, could you give me my next slide for some reason? 
my clicky clicky's not working. So <clears throat> this first year it's been $25 per machine and it is going to go up and that's for Windows 7 Enterprise. As you see for Windows 7 Pro it was even more, $50 per machine that kept you uh, patched and, and good to go. It's going to go up even more as of January rolling forward. So about one quarter from now it'll go up $50 and $100 is doubling in its price. So if you haven't gotten your users off of Windows 7, there's now even more reason to do so. And let's take a look at the next slide where we are in the environment and uh, where we are in the world for movement to Windows 7. And this is as of this month. So it's not stale data in here. You're not learning about why users should have gotten off Windows 7 247 days ago. You're learning where the world is today. So as of, you see the calendar at the far right of this graph, August of 2008, the metrics are for Windows in the world as follows. <clears throat> About 60% of the Windows machines in the world are now running Windows 10. And this is based off of internet browsing data, so it also covers the home market. Corporations should be roughly in line with that, in my opinion, plus or minus 10% of the same metrics. And then if you look at the lighter blue, you'll see that Windows 7 continues to uh, lose ground, as rightfully it should now that support has expired. But may be shocking, may not be shocking to you that the world is still running roughly about 22-23% on Windows 7. So we know firsthand, Jack and I both know uh, from firsthand speaking to customers, many customers do still have Windows 7. Once you implement our solutions, as you'll see today, it no longer matters uh, because um, the user can experience zero downtime and get over to Windows 10 very easily. Let's talk about the the way that uh, you know it was thought that Windows 10 would be the one OS to rule them all. As we now know, that's not the case. Windows 10 has had significant changes in the user profile that has broken the user profile and kept users from seamlessly moving from one deployment of Windows to the next. So Windows 10 changes can be just as dramatic as Windows 7 to 10 changes. Jack, you want to recap some of these and, and what we're looking at? Also, tell the audience what we're looking at, you know, for example, when we see 1909. What does that mean? Does that sure. is that a date? Yeah. Yeah. So what you're what you're looking at here is actually the various different profile versionings of Windows operating systems. Um, I, I can even translate some of the server operating systems because the, the build versions are kind of similar. So everything obviously started with Windows XP as a version one, Windows 7 being a version two, eight was kind of a three, four, and then 10 came into the picture. And then the, the first iteration was V5, which had kind of two versions. And then 1607 came around, which is what I would think that most people are familiar with as probably the first version of Windows 10 that they worked with. Um, V6 is, is basically the same equivalent of running a 2016 server, right? That's what the operating system is built on. So 1607 being the build version of Windows 10, 1607 also being the build version of 2016 server or terminal servers, that's a V6. Now, as we progress on, there was actually a shift change into the profile format when it came to the 1703 series of, uh, of the Windows 10 operating system and it progressively changes. Now, the reason why I don't have V7, V8, V9, V10 on this particular slide is because technically it is a v6 profile but the gotcha is, is that windows is kind of two operating systems mashed into one you've got the core operating system that you're familiar with that you know has pretty much been the same since windows 7 on and then you have modern apps well that's the part that gets things a little bit sideways is that the modern applications are the dots version the core version being six is the typical third-party applications, registry keys, things like that. Well, what can happen is, is as you progress up the versions, yeah, you might be able to upgrade to, you know, 1703, 1709, all the way up to uh, 2004, which is the latest revision. I think 20, I think they're going to call it 2009 or something like that, um, is the next revision that's coming out pretty soon from Microsoft of the fall uh, 20. 2020 editions 
but the gotcha is is that as you progress up, some app, some modern applications tend to not be compatible. Um, they might upgrade, but there's no going back, right? So being able to move from one iteration of the operating system to the next iteration of the operating system can be important, but having the ability to fall back in the chance that the operating system were to blow up um, is also very important. And and I, I've talked to several organizations that say, well, when is the chances of that going to happen? Yeah, it happened in 1809. It, it happened very, very clearly in 1809 where Microsoft really actually had to pull back the the build because it was blowing up the workstations and blowing up the uh the, the profiles themselves so with that we have kind of a universal profile format that allows you to go from you know a 1607 say terminal server to a 1909 or 2004 windows 10 operating system and back Whereas with a traditional profile, roaming profile, a citrus profile, even even a profile disk, you could not do that. You would have to have the server operating system profile and a desktop profile, or even between Windows 10 operating systems, you'd have to have you know build one, build two. You couldn't move between the two builds, and there would just be no compatibility. Um, just for those who are not uh, sure, the Windows 2019 server is technically 1809 almost bleeding into 1903 so they're kind of in that little middle ground um but that's kind of the progression and and i have a funny feeling that microsoft is probably going to put out a 2021 or 2022 version of the server os down the line so they're going to keep things moving as quickly as possible uh as well as their windows 10 operating systems so one of the funny things i didn't realize until a couple of years ago was that these codes 1507 as you see going through 1909 here and, and as jack said there's even more now that stands for the more or less the year and the month that they released that version number and i know that might be old hat to a lot of our listeners but um i have also heard people shocked to hear that they didn't realize that either so it coincides with the date the the year being 2019 the month being september um the ninth month yeah, uh, Microsoft is trying to scrap that naming convention, by the way, um, because they keep missing the month. So now they call it H1, H2. So it's 20 H1, 20 H2, though it still has the, the build version mm -hmm, numbers mm -hmm. on there. They always H1 miss their, being first half of the year. First half of the year, yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. Which they're, not, they're not exactly straightforward, and if you're unless you're an accountant that uses H1, H2, or Q1, Q2, 3 for quarters, you wouldn't get that either. But it's... Uh, yeah, it's interesting that you know a lot of people I've spoken to didn't even know that that was this just looks abstract you know in version numbers almost but uh, so we overcome this with our portability engine right and so the profile looks more or less like you see it on the right and the largest breaks a v2 and a v3 really change the location in windows where these things are application data became app data for example as you see in those graphics uh, when when that changed you may even see a little hook in your operating system. Looks like a little shortcut if you go poking around. And that's to help some things remediate with it, Windows th in themselves. But uh, our portability engine is different. It helps the, as Jack said, profile disk, roaming profiles, things like that. FS Logics is a profile type disk, for example. It helps bridge that to a profile bridge where seamlessly at every single login, that profile will work across those. So once you have Profile Unity implemented in your environment and you keep Profile Unity up to date, um, you, your users will be able to seamlessly log on to one of these operating systems and the next. And that's where we get that zero user downtime because that profile will follow them no matter where they are, at least the parts that make them productive. The top three migration challenges we'll go through today. When you're moving from platform to platform or OS to OS, now this could be platform to platform. And what I mean by that is maybe you've been on VMware View for a while and now you decide it's right to try some Microsoft WVD or more likely Citrix on Azure Cloud. Or maybe it was the other way around, Citrix on Azure Cloud and you've decided to try uh, VMware View Horizon and you want to move platform to platform or maybe try Amazon workspaces, doesn't matter. 
we're going to show you how these things will follow the user. So the top three migration challenges in any migration, whether it's OS or platform to platform, making sure that your users have applications they need to make them productive, making sure their user environment is indeed readily available, even if you change out the OS, that you don't have to worry about breaking things, and that their user authored data is always saved with best practices in mind so you have that mission critical data and access to it no matter where they are. And we encounter many organizations that have never implemented best practices. They're still letting users save data to individual hard drives on physical PCs. So we have a methodology to get you out of that. We do that with our cloud staging. Now I'm going to talk about cloud staging your data, your apps today to be able to seamlessly move users across. But in a physical desktop environment, if you never wanted to touch cloud, you could also leverage areas of your um, your physical environment, your storage area network uh, to be able to do this. And that is just file shares to be able to do that. So keep in mind, we support object-based storage on Amazon, Google, and, um, and, and Microsoft to be able to stage your data and actually use it in a production environment, or you can also do this on-prem with file shares, or you can do both. So wherever you hear me say cloud staging, just know that's not exclusive. If you don't want to stage things in the clouds or you can't do it because of compliance reasons, you can do that on-prem as well. But this methodology allows you to leverage centralized points, whether it's in the cloud or on-prem, to be able to transform your desktops. Uh, it enables you to coexist desktops, so different OS versions, different platforms, so you can lift and shift your users over to moment no, moment's notice. For example, work from home. You had to send your users like we did as a society to allow users to work from home back in March. You could allow them to do that at a moment's notice and log on to an entirely different desktop. It enables a zero user downtime to your next desktop. You'll see that today in the demonstration. This is our cloud staging graphic, and, and this is leveraged from a work from home session that I did earlier, but it works the same across any type of desktop transformation. If we start on the left and you have what you've deemed your legacy Windows desktops for your migration, you can use those to assess and harvest and manage your users and to save your user data in the cloud or on-prem. Everything is also hosted, as you see at the graphic here in the middle of the slide at the bottom, you can do this on-prem as well. So not just cloud, your user profiles, your applications, and your user data, and your UX data can follow the user from one desktop to the next. With our object-based storage that we have in place, we support any of those clouds to store that on, or on-prem, or both, so you can have a failover. And then likewise, you see when you're receiving the data for your new desktop platform on the right, user profiles, applications, user data, and the UX data that's baselined across both can seamlessly flow to your next desktop of choice. And that can be mixed all the way to your far right. So you have a methodology going forward where you're always keeping your data staged. It is disconnected, really disjoined from that OS where it's no longer a monolith, it is dynamic and your user data and applications can flow in. Application staging. So questions that'll come up is how do I know what I have today? Which applications are in use? Is there a better way to handle applications to make them more dynamic going forward? And that's the challenge. And you can do that by knowing what applications are in use. You need to know what applications might not be compatible with the OS, which ones may be compatible with the virtual desktop environment going forward. And now is now the right time to rethink your application data and the way that you're receiving those. Should you try out AppV, ThinApp, MSIX, or AppAttach, or indeed FlexApp from Liquidware? So knowing what you have today is very important, and we are able to do that with Stratosphere. Liquidware Stratosphere, you run that in the legacy environment first. You know what you have. Jack, would you like to speak to this report that we've learned from one organization? 
Sure. Um, so what you're looking at here is the various different applications that users might have, um, and, and it kind of has a little bit of a user percentage density. Now the key with these types of things is uh, how many times do people load the application of, of the installed versus used, how many people are actually in fact using these applications, and then when it comes to the complexity of the applications, we're looking for a couple key things, uh, things like services things like DCOM objects, things like drivers, those uh, various different elements can make applications very complex or very difficult uh, to virtualize. And what I mean by virtualize is things like AppV, ThinApp, where it's in a bubble. Um, our app compatibility index isn't really uh, gonna be too much of a factor when it comes to flex apps, because those things that were typically kind of show stoppers for, really anything, AppV, ThinApp, MSIX, uh, are not showstoppers with application layering technology such as FlexApp. Uh, so being able to get a score and say, you know what, this is probably not a good application, you know, maybe ADK setup is more of a start, you know, installation thing, universal install can have some complexity. Office is usually notoriously very difficult, but things like FileZilla, anybody can do that one, right? Really simple, uh, Chrome, for example, does have services, it doesn't have any drivers though. And then when you get into really difficult applications like Autodesk type stuff, um, there are services, there are drivers, there's a lot of components to that. And the complexity of those applications tends to go up. So understanding not necessarily what is installed on the workstations, but what your user base is in fact using, and then make those decisions whether there's low-hanging fruit of things that I want to put into a layer, something I want to put into the image, or something that maybe I need to isolate uh, is an important part of the overall strategy, right? Because not one solution uh, solves all the problems. All right. Knowing what you have, so you are prepared to, to figure out your application strategy going forward. And then this is a good point to remind people, our audience, that we love to field questions. So submit those, please, to the uh, chat window, and we'll get to those as we go through. If you're on social media, also give us a shout out, and we'll follow you, and uh, if you'll follow us. So Liquidware FlexApp, not only Stratosphere, but FlexApp supports application staging as well. FlexApp is application layering application layering that separates the applications from the monolith of putting it in the OS. It allows you to package applications only one time. And when I say package applications, it's as easy as installing an application and they're saved off to a VHD or a VHDX. <clears throat> a local filter driver makes the application look like it is installed in the uh, virtual desktop or even a well-managed physical desktop, including uh, we also support RDS environments and Windows WVD. The main goal here is that once you've separated out, you've reduced your number of desktop images and you no longer have to keep these applications installed on individual desktops, whether physical or virtual. The approach of using a filter driver keeps application compatibility very high. The um, compatibility rating for the types of applications that we can virtualize or layer in this way remains very high because the application looks like it is indeed natively installed in the environment. And that's the key difference between FlexApp and MSIX and AppV is that we don't provide any sort of isolation. So those solutions have their use cases, but FlexApp has a high degree of compatibility because it is not isolated in the environment. <clears throat> FlexApp man does support any type of Windows desktop, well-managed, well-connected desktops. Again, the laptop use case is not a great one for this if the user is going to be out of the office most of the time. This is a, a use case for physical desktops that are connected to the environment, as well as virtual desktops. Because we don't isolate, yet AppV and MSIX does isolate, makes it a perfect complement to those technologies. And cloud staging is made easy when we because we support object-based storage as well, as well as file shares on, on cloud, if you wish, or on-prem. <clears throat> Here's some evidence of our object-based storage in uh, with FlexApp. 
in this case, we have saved the, our, our packages to Azure, as you can see here. Um, this is looking at the file share itself, where Chrome is saved on Azure once it was packaged, and it is saved as a, uh, as a VHD, supporting directly blob-based storage. And why this is unique is because you don't even have to have file shares when we support object-based storage, so there's no file shares to manage. In other words, a file share is a Windows server usually, or a Linux server in the background, so you don't have any of those to manage once you have object-based storage support. And we support those use cases as well, but we make things very, very simple by supporting object-based storage where you can stage these. From within the OS itself, if you were to go looking for this, you'll see the evidence that Chrome is being received into the environment <clears throat> and it's supported on that environment as an attached storage mechanism from Azure, again, from object-based storage. So an important thing to remember when you're doing your user environment management staging, your user staging, is that your user is your most important customer. If you're a desktop administrator, as many of you are, that's who we serve daily, is the user, making sure that they're productive. So you want to make sure that they have an uninterrupted workflow. Yeah, it's easy to say, no, we're going greenfield. The user will have to recreate their spell checkers. They'll have to recreate their signatures. They'll have to recreate all those things that make their desktop unique to them and keep them productive. But you have to admit, there's going to be some user downtime in there for them re recreating all those things if you go greenfield. So the pain's going to be real. User adoption is going to be slowed. And you're going to have help desk calls. When you have a user environment that follows the user and keeps them productive, you, you keep that user performing. And if you can do that seamlessly like you can with Profile Unity, it is a better way to do this and avoid migrations altogether from the end user point of view. Handling the profiles where they remain dynamic across any type of desktop platform or operating system. So they dynamically adapt at every single login within just a few seconds is a much better way to handle this, to keep your user happy, to keep them productive and performing. Help desk calls are lower. You can also handle very large files with our own profile disk and our compatibility with FS Logics. And you can handle user authored data with file shares like OneDrive. User profiles, as we stated, are not dynamic. The OS changes break the, the, the uh, user profile. You simply can't take a ROM profile or a profile disk, even from Liquidware or FS Logics, and expect it to adapt to the next operating system. So if you're rolling out a new desktop image, there's going to be pains in there. If you don't do testing, you may find that you've broken the entire user environment and profile, and they're getting a generic profile laid down at login, and that's going to cause a lot of help desk calls, going to cause a, a lack of productivity. So there are ways to do this with user state migration from Microsoft, but that is largely inefficient. You're looking at taking your user's desktops down for a period of anywhere two days to two hours to two days on the extreme. Copy and paste methods of trying to make the profile work are inefficient and largely don't work in a lot of areas because you can't trace down all those or be expected to trace down all those in a migration at mass scale. As we discussed already, greenfield rip and replace is not exactly the best solution, uh, albeit a lot of organizations use it and then they allow us to manage the profile going forward. Uh, we don't recommend greenfield rip and replace usually. Policies may get tied to Citrix and VMware and Microsoft, and that's because they have monolithic tools for managing profiles. Anything from roaming profiles to Citrix User Profile Manager to VMware UEM, all those are designed for that one desktop platform and do not keep you dynamic and your users dynamic to be able to burst scale users. For example, we helped a lot of organizations do this work from home. Burst scale users into Amazon Workspaces to work from home using that. And then once the uh, COVID um, ramifications are over and all the things that we've had to adhere to, they can go back to physical desktops 
if you have that in place, you can do that with Profile Unity. We're fully compatible with the way that you manage profiles from other vendors, all those that you see there in those profile tools, albeit we are adaptive. We allow you to work across all those different platforms and to change, to make your, to change for business uh, reasons or for disaster recovery, to have business continuity plans in place. Profile Unity does that because it keeps profiles dynamic. The, the profile remains compatible both backward and forward, and that's a big difference. For example, from USMT, you can only go one way with those types of technologies. You can't go backward, so you can't really mix environments. The migrations, you know, you've long thought out and planned, let's move this department at a time or that department at a time, and, and when Profile Unity is in place, you don't have to do that. You can move a few users in a department at a time. That's because the OS uh, profiles remain dynamic. Applications can remain dynamic too when you're laying them down with FlexApp. Smart profiles are harvested. What do I mean by smart profiles? Profiles that have eliminated the cache and all the trash areas. Only the most reliable profile data that keeps users productive is harvested with our portability rule sets. And portability is a way of keeping the profile um, chunked in individual file and registry bits that remain compatible with Windows going forward. And it is what makes a profile disk or an FS Logix disk even better when it's used together. You're ending the migration cycle for end users. You're keeping things compatible uh, across OSs and you're keeping uh, your FS Logix or your profile disk in sync with our portability technologies. Profile rollbacks are easy. Profile disk technologies can have a corrupted profile, even the one from Liquidware can, but our portability engine will restore that profile at a moment's notice and indeed almost automatic. And, and, and in the first quarter of next year, we will have automatic resets of profiles. Cloud staging is of course made easy because we support embedded object-based storage in addition to file shares, if you wanna do that on-prem with all the major cloud vendors. Here's some evidence of the um, object-based storage being functionality being built right in to Liquidware's Profile Unity. You pick a profile storage area, whether that's on-prem or any of the clouds of your choice, as you see here. Google Cloud Storage is selected here in the guided configuration. If you choose that, your profiles will be staged there. They'll be harvested off the endpoints at first log off, and they'll be available to go to that next desktop at a moment's notice within seconds. Again, you just add your cloud credentials in here. We've developed this far beyond any other vendor in the space. This is in an innovative area here, and we truly lead in object-based storage options while allowing you that same option to keep things on-prem if you wish. Here we see that the profile path is actually an S3 Amazon path. Here we see where our, our profile portability and this is where I was speaking about all the rule sets in here are uh, being saved off individually. In this case, if you look at the save path to the far right, they're being saved in Amazon's uh, or Azure storage rather. The A was throwing me off, but in Azure based storage. And here we see they're stored in Amazon's S3 storage in the save path. You can actually uh, have dis, um, disaster recovery in place for business continuity and save to two clouds if you wish. And here's what it looks like when it's in the cloud, when you're looking at that uh, storage area. <clears throat> User authored data state. So we, we treat the profile the way that I just outlined it with portability, saving off parts of the profile, the most smart profile, a smart profile harvest to those areas. But how do we handle user authored data st uh, storage, some of the most important storage? <clears throat> we handle user authored data storage a little differently. And that is, this is the use case where we see that organizations have been letting uh, users save data to hard drives, for example, or anywhere they wish, and there's no uh, uniformity in there and have they're redirecting their files. So the questions that you may be asked on any migration is, can you seamlessly harvest that user authored data to get into a best practice state of being? How can you leverage cloud services um, to do this or on-prem 
And can you ensure, in other words, can I check to make sure that user author data has indeed been harvested and the user is ready for their next desktop? We do have a way of doing that within Profile Unity. Prior to the user author data redirection, what we'll do is we will harvest off in the background while the user is working, we'll harvest off the data to a new location. Could be cloud or could be object-based. We can also have ways to exclude files that the user maybe shouldn't have in the first place, such as MP3s or MP4s or large files. You can exclude those from the stack automatically. And you can inventory that with Profile Unity to make sure that the data harvesting has occurred and you can check in on the status of that. So you know before they move over that their gigabyte and gigabytes of data have indeed been harvested and they'll be redirected to their new machine at the next logon. The cloud staging is indeed made easy because of the support of object-based storage um, as well as file-based file storage from all the major vendors. Here's a look at that, again, within the UI. Again, we've been very innovative in this area. There's no scripting required. Um, there's, uh, we support it out of the box. As you see here, the, the folder redirection setting is being, um, is being steered off to object-based storage in this case. We're gonna redirect to a folder that's uh, My Documents and we're gonna sync it to a new location. In this location, we can, in this in this instance, we can make sure that it is synced up to uh, an area where OneDrive could pick it up, for example, or Dropbox or other things. And again, this uh, will come through in your uh, configuration settings in, in Profile Unity. We can also limit this uh, to, to trickle down based on bandwidth and other things. So we not only redirect, but we will harvest off that area. I want to talk about our architecture real quick. Uh, also ask Ray, have you seen any questions come through, Ray? We might want to address. Yeah, we do have one uh, on FlexApp, and someone asked, can FlexApp be used for all physical desktops and laptops with Windows 10 OS? The answer is kind of. <laughs> um, Laptops are probably not a good play, mostly because the laptop uh, has usually inconsistent connections, and that's the key. When you're attaching a volume to the operating system, even with even with the object-based storage, um, only a certain amount of the blocks are gonna, are going to be cached uh, within the guest operating system, not all of. So, if for example you access a section of the application that has not yet been cached and it has no access to the object-based storage and or a file share in which uh, the the blocks or the disks are accessed from, you might actually run into an error or crash the app. So this is a little bit different than completely caching the entirety of the application down into the OS. Now, if these laptops or desktops are always connected to a network or you can always guarantee consistency of network connections to the internet, then the answer is yeah, they can actually be used for physical workstations and laptops just the same because when we log off the system, we clean up the applications uh, off the operating system. Now, with cache mode, we do leave the cache behind so you don't have to repull the cache unless the application itself has been changed. Mm -hmm. So, hence the kind of answer. Yep, and that's the case with with, uh, with FlexApp. I like to say about uh, laptops, even with Profile Unity, <clears throat> the best laptop that we support, the best use case for supporting laptops is laptops that are occasionally out of the office. And now that a lot of us are working from home, a lot of laptops are out of the office. But <clears throat> it's, those use, it's those workers that maybe travel once a month. And for FlexApp, yeah, they'd have to have a well-connected desktop to have access to their apps. So not the best case for FlexApp, but for Profile Unity, the profile will go offline. It leaves a local copy on that machine and your policy settings also will sync back up when the user is again connected to the corporate network. So there are some workarounds in some areas to make sure that you have the apps you need and when you need them. Um, and then the use case for supporting laptops is pretty broad if you have users that mostly work in the office. Good question. <clears throat> and then speaking about how Profile Unity is leveraged, I'll take you through the architecture real quick. So we support any type of Windows desktop, including laptops with the, uh, with the uh, the qualifiers that we just stated as well. But um, once they're connected to the network, 
the user configuration for Profile Unity, which is uh, cached down to the endpoint, or it's usually installed to the endpoint, which will save you a few seconds at login time. It will look for the configuration, which is out on a file share, and that could be an object-based area, area as well. Uh, so if it's on-prem, it'd be a, a file share. If it was an object-based area, you could have it in the cloud of your choice that it was heading. Um, for profiles to be pulled down, they're also pulled down from the cloud of your choice or on-prem from a file share. And then the applications will come in from a VHD or VHDX from, um, from on-prem file shares as well as object-based storage from any of the major cloud vendors. When we're looking at user authored data, we support any of the uh, file services that you see here and more. Uh, so you can redirect to those locations where they'll start syncing. In the use case I talked about for user authored data being synced off to an area where OneDrive could pick it up, for example, the user would be then working off of OneDrive going forward and their My Documents, for example, would be redirected to the area where OneDrive sync. Same thing for any of the other services you see here, uh, Google Drive, Dropbox, Amazon WorkDocs, for example, or <clears throat> Citrix's um, service for share. There are very few dependencies in this um, architecture. That is that you don't have to have any dedicated um, Windows servers in the mix or SQL servers or things of that nature. That's only needed for the um, for the app management console itself or profile unity. So the management console uh, would need to run on a um, on a Windows server that could also be in the cloud. Uh, it could be on prem or in the cloud. Usually it's either in the data center or in the cloud based data center. And it is only used to write for configurations, for example, and to enforce licenses. So you won't have any license warnings or errors if you keep that machine on. That's the only uh, additional um, machine that is in needed in an environment is one for the management console. If it goes offline, it fails safe. You'd only get a license warning to, uh, that you can't authenticate licensing and it's back up. So when compared to other user environment management vendors, at scale, we have much fewer dependencies and we don't lock the profile down to a proprietary data format. When the user profile comes down to the endpoint and the policies are set, they're set in the areas where Windows likes to see them. Therefore, you're never really locked in with Profile Unity. We never create a data jail in effect, which is a big advantage of us over other solutions in the market for UEM. I'll show a quick demo today with and without Profile Unity and Flex App running in an environment, uh, creating a seamless migration. So the first part that you'll see in this demo is a user logging into a machine that they have been told they have a new desktop and the desktop is gonna be plain vanilla. In this case, it's a WVD desktop. The user logs in on their first day of their desktop. They're excited to see how this migration went. FS Logix is running, which we're fully compatible with. But in this case, FS Logix is just going to lay down what the Windows machine has as a generic profile. None of the user persistency has come across. The user doesn't even necessarily have the apps they need. So now they're disappointed. They don't have the apps they need to work other than Microsoft Office is part of the base image in this demo. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, it's a pretty generic desktop. Now they've got to figure out how they recreate all that user persistency. Now they have hours ahead of them to try to figure out how they are going to get their task done. And, you know, O365 might be an answer for them and there are some other things. But what's even better is when you have staged the user environment and the applications to come across from Profile Unity and Flex App. So now we're going to go back into the Profile Unity and Flex App. Um, management console because actually this organization did stage the data they just didn't activate it now it's activated where it will be activated on that new desktop user profiles were harvested from this user it was properly done uh, user uh, applications indeed will come down applications per user I should say in this case profile unity will lay down applications at login at boot time and on a click to layer basis so um, you'll see one, one application that we have in here actually has not been laid down until the user clicks on it. So let's activate 
this and make sure it's applied to these desktops. And we'll indeed go over to the, uh, in this case, over to Azure, and we'll activate the configuration, which is a little I and I file that our agent looks to, uh, to make sure it's applied to the same exact desktop that the user is gonna log into. And to do that, we open up Azure, and we're gonna make sure that that I and I file is in there. And that's what our agent's really looking for, is a little I and I file to say, where's the user profile stored? What applications does the user have access to? What policy should they have to give a follow me desktop, a zero downtime user migration um, experience to the end user? Now we're gonna log into this same exact desktop now that we've activated all that. And you'll see that FS Logic still runs, a generic profile is laid down, but now Profile Unity kicks in. And that staged profile comes down that keeps the user productive across operating system versions and across desktop platform versions. And now look at all the applications that hit the same exact desktop. The applications have been brought in by FlexApp, the applications that the user needs to do their job on a department by department basis. We can assign things to the HR department, to the financial department, for example. In here we have this XML little shortcut on the desktop, which is a click to layer application. It's actually not even mounted yet, and that's the one example we have in here. The rest of the other uh, applications in here are good to go. When you click on them, they launch. It's instantaneous, and the user knows no different from a Flex app or one that's locally installed to their desktop or their virtual desktop. We'll open up a couple applications. We'll show you how they perform. Of course, Notepad's a small application, but uh, we'll open that up. We'll also open up larger applications to show you how that works. Notepad's not actually installed in this environment. So as you see there, when we click on Chromium Edge, uh, it takes a moment for that one to load because it was clicked to layer. It was actually not mounted to that environment until the user clicked on it. So this may be an application that you think is occasionally used. So you might not want to have it layered into the environment until the user clicks on it. Now, Cisco WebEx Meetings, you may be familiar with it, and it is actually layered in the environment and already attached, but we're gonna log into that, and we're gonna show you that it launches just like it was natively in the environment. And how native is it indeed in the environment? That's a good question. How does it interact with other apps? Well, let's open up Outlook, which is part of the base image I told you earlier. Uh, we can layer Office, but in this case, we do recommend that for, you see, WebEx is indeed in here with buttons. So it's very tightly recognized in the environment and you could set up a meeting if you wish. Uh, so WebEx is not isolated, doesn't run isolated like Microsoft App V or MSIX. So it's actually able to integrate and talk to the applications. Uh, in this case, Outlook, which is in the base image, we're scheduling up a meeting. So it interacts and it has a high degree of compa compatibility um, as a Flex app to be able to interact with other applications. When you isolate an app through isolation technologies, that's not always the case, especially with something like VMware Thin App. It can't interact with other applications. You have to go through steps to open up the bubble to make sure it can interact with other apps. That's not the case with Flex App. So as you can see, this user was able to log in to their new desktop, have zero user downtime, have the applications they need to follow them to that desktop, have the user profile in there, their Outlook signature, and everything that they needed to make that user productive. And that's what we mean by a zero user downtime migration and uh, one that is indeed productive for the end user. Let's recap what you need for a seamless user migration. You need to think about assessing your legacy desktops and applications so you can right size the environment and know what applications are there. Make sure you leave no mission critical data behind. Harvest off user authored data. You can automate that process with Profile Unity. You can, you know, make sure you prepare your base golden image. You think about the applications that you want to put in there. You know, as in the demo today, Office was in that. Which applications are going to be in that base image? Which ones you're going to layer? And which ones do you need isolation for? That you need AppV or MSIX or ThinApp? Ensure that that user data is available, that you've staged it either on-prem or in the cloud like we've talked about today. 
that their that user authored data is actually backed up on DFS replicated servers, for example, or through partners like Piercing, and that you can monitor the user experience before, during, and after with something like Stratosphere UX to ensure that you're providing that seamless migration across any OS and across any desktop delivery platform. To see if we have any other questions that have come in today, Ray, do you see any? Yeah, we sure do. Um, here's one. Someone asked, how can this help with ransomware? That is a good question, and I'll take the lead on that one. Let Jack add to it. A lot of organizations run their users uh, as uh, desktop administrators, which is like a worst case scenario for ransomware going live in the wild. Running Profile Unity, we have, we didn't talk about it today, but we have privilege elevation. So for the occasional use that you have to have a user uh, that needs elevated privileges to run an app or install a certain app, you can whitelist things in there and, and only give this privileged elevation to certain users, keep them as standard users, not as admins. And that's your worst case scenario that's taken care of. Jack, can you think of, uh, so, so in other words, you can't just, you could, you could not, you could leave it to where standard users can't execute applications is one way. And I know ransomware can get in through a variety of means. Jack, can you think of other areas that we help out in ransomware? Uh, you can pretty much set the workstation down into like more of a kiosk mode and only allow the users to launch certain applications. Another thing is, is that ransomware tends to embed itself into the update a local directory. Um, and we don't grab the entirety of the update a local directory. We grab only kind of more specific items out of there. Uh, so if you have a non-persistent workstation, for example, um, going through and just kind of flushing back the OS and then, you know, kind of logging back in and loading your profile, there's a very low footprint um, for ransomware to kind of attach itself in that environment. So, you know, in a lot of times, um, because we're very selective as the type of stuff that is being gathered as part of the profile versus a, you know, a profile disk, which is kind of everything, right? Um, we don't tend to run into a lot of ransomware issues uh, because of that. Um, but again, that's that's very much based on a non-persistent or stateless operating system. Uh, if you go down the route of more of a state operating system, then, you know, there's a couple ways you can attack that one. You just go and delete the profile out of the C drive, uh, assuming that's where the uh, ransomware originated at. Um, otherwise, re-imaging a, a guest operating system and bringing it back and then basically saying, all right, log in, your stuff is there, doesn't make, you know, does make things very easy because you're basically offloading all the user settings and author data somewhere else. So what's a value on the laptop that's being locked up? Very little. Right. Yeah. So in a VDI environment, you give that non-persistent use case Jack talked about, that desktops are fresh every day anyway. In a physical desktop environment, yes, you can start to think about your desk. If you manage your desktops with this adaptive workspace management, you can start to think about them as being non-persistent as well. So you can reset them to a uh, to the last image and get the user back up and running quickly if something happens to those desktops. That's a good question. Um, the desktop lockdown that that Jack talked about is uh, our power in the, we didn't talk about this today, but power, our policy engine is very robust in Profile Unity. It runs with admin privileges on what it can do at login. So you can take registry keys that are allocated not only to the user, but at a machine level, and this is different than some com competitors out there. Not all of them can do machine level, and the ones that are are doing it now, have recently added it only through pressure of us being able to do it. Um, and you can lock down machine attributes, disable USB executions, for example, disable USB saves, um, make it to where users can't even open the control panel, uh, and a variety of different things in there that can help protect your environment with Profile Unity. We have a lockdown configuration, by the way, if there's current customers on, you can find that under our knowledge base files. And um, the configuration has traced down a lot of these registry keys that work across Windows 7 and 10. Okay, uh, before we get off the ransomware topic, somebody else chimed in on this and uh, was talking about protecting the profile and how do you restore our previous day's version? 
All right, Jack, take that. Yeah, there's a couple ways. Um, some organizations will use BSS so that the file servers themselves have, you know, a previous version of that profile. Um, we do actually have a profile backup option within Profile Unity that will just basically keep X amount of profiles intact within the file server. So if you do need to restore, you just you know go to the file server, delete out the old profile, copy paste the new profile or the old profile back in, log in, and you are back to yesterday. Um, some of this can kind of be automated through just PowerShell. You know, pick up which directory you want to restore, done, and it just it's a copy paste process. So um, because we don't have the database in the middle of uh, of everything, really it is just as simple as copy paste. So thanks. And and the profile rollback, um, we can archive up to what is it, 99 different yep. versions of the profile, if you wish. Yep. Generally a handful is fine because that will cover the last more than likely last five log off attempts, which uh, five days of log ons, log offs, you'll have a backup of the profile and um, the help desk can easily restore that to the right directory and have the user log back on and the profiles restored. Okay, great. We got a few more questions here. Um, one person asked, can you comment more on the application complexity score? This was probably about, um, I don't know, almost 20 minutes ago. Uh, and they said that, for example, MS Teams was listed as a 10. Yeah, uh, it, it with that one, that, that might have been an older report that was on the screenshot there, because the original MS Teams was traditionally installed into the update a local directory structure. So that would be a more complex application. In fact, that would be a non-starter application for FlexApp, because we don't gather uh, or, or capture anything that goes into the user profile. Um, there's ways around that, however, by the way, um, but that might have been another report when you move into the new versions of Teams where it actually installs into program files or Teams for BDI, I'd probably put that complexity at a zero. The application's super simple now. So, yeah, that just might have been an old image. Yeah, somebody's closely watching. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, that's, I think, really the big key. I forgot about that is is if applications tend to install themselves into that app data local directory, uh, really any capture product would have an issue with that because it's it's so unique to the user that captured it. Um, the workaround, however, is is that during the capture procedure, what you can do is you can move that directory that was copied in in essence to the app data local directory into you know program files make a folder, right? Because we capture the whole operating system as it's being done. And then what you can do is you can drop in a sim link as a post activate script into the user's app data directory structure, which then points to the program file directory. So if the application is hard coded to say, hey, my stuff is an app data local, you can actually point it to the program files directory and everybody can use this, the, uh, the, the, the bits and bytes out of the program files directory. So there very much is ways to kind of dance around applications that act that way. Um, hopefully there isn't too many in your organization, but I know kind of off the top of my head that, you know, Chrome sometimes does that or used to do that. Um, uh, Shortel, uh, tele, telecom or tele uh, IP phone software can do that from time to time. And all of those workarounds tend to work pretty well of, you know, move it, sim it, done. Hmm. Cool. Good. All right. Here's a, there's a few questions that all kind of point to the same thing here. Um, and they are basically asking, is Profile Unity basically a replacement for X platform tool? Um, so without going into every single one of these ones mm -hmm. that have been brought up here, maybe we can kind of just touch on that a little bit more. I know we you mentioned it yeah. earlier, but um, maybe bring bring back full circle. No, that. yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, the answer is yes, is that you would generally replace a platform tool that was from Citrix or VMware or anyone else with Profile Unity because it's far more capable, according to us at least, right? But no, honestly, it's far more capable because we support any way Windows is delivered, not just through Citrix or not just through VMware. And that has advantages to a Citrix environment too. I, I'm not saying we compete against Citrix, just an example, right? Because you might, Citrix, Citrix as an organization wants to see physical desktops flow into a Citrix environment. And we're experts at doing that. Um, of course, you could flow the other way out to a different platform. Um, so 
that's one of the main advantages is that we support any way physical, virtual, uh, and cloud-based desktops across those, and that keeps you dynamic across those. So yes, you would generally replace the platform uh, tool with Profile Unity's full user environment management, and there's different advantages to different platform tools. Some of them are more capable than others, and I won't call out which ones that is. Those are, but um, the fact that we support any of them, and then we don't lock you in, and you're not in a monolithic state of being, uh, is a great advantage for business continuity and things like that. So with COVID back in March, uh, I, I cited a similar use case earlier, but not everybody wanted to burst scale their XYZ environment. They were like, no, that's good, but I want to try this QIX environment because I know that the cost per desktop in the cloud is going to be a lot less. So they burst scaled and left their XYZ environment alone, but their QIX environment was net new and they said, work from home users, try this new cloud environment out, and they were able to do that. So you can mix and match at a moment's notice by doing this and you can switch from one to the next. And if you decide that there's more innovation in a stack or that it works better for your 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 type of environment. But the general answer is yes. You, the, the exception in that is for FS Logix, for example. A lot of people listening have access now to FS Logix as a profile disk. And we're not going to ask you to remove that. We can make FS Logix better. We can make a profile coexist across multiple versions of Windows. Um, we can, if the if the profile disk for FS Logix becomes corrupt, you can roll back profiles because you're also relying on portability that has connected those. And we can give you a policy engine in addition to that with Profile Unity's policy management. We we discuss some of those things like privilege elevation policies that run HKLM much easier than group policy preferences. So that is one of the exceptions where you could run that in tandem, or you could run our profile disk, which has some advantages. But uh, profile uh, FS Logics and Profile Unity is a true better together uh, story. There actually is one more use case um, that I've run into from time to time is if you're already on a a platform um, and and you're happy with it. Let's just say you know whatever profile management tool you're working with works, but you really like the the rights management stuff or you really like the application layering stuff you very much can use both of those technologies in parallel with each other. Um, Citrix, as an example, a lot of people were really into the layering technologies and they wanted to use the Citrix layering to manage their guest operating systems. But when it came to the last mile applications, you know, the onesie twosie things, the things that they would have to compile more and more images with, um, and they weren't too keen on using elastic layering, I have customers who actually used FlexApp layers to handle the last mile stuff. They use Citrix layering to handle the image uh, the, the image creation or patch management components, and they use both technologies for their best you know best parts. Um, so we we try to fill the gaps of things that you feel are missing, you know. Mm -hmm. And and if that means replacing one profile solution with another, so be it. But if you're like, no, I'm good with what I have. I just need you know, rights elevation, or I just need layers, or I want to, you know, make an easier way to put registry injections into the operating system. We just fill the gaps, whatever, whatever you want to supplement, we're good with. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was great. A, a great uh, appendix to yep. what I had said, because it complemented the, uh, at the um, layering side of the story, for sure. Right. right. And another part is, um, we don't nickel and dime you at Liquidware. You get everything. You You pay one cost, you get the whole entire profile unity suite the apps the compro the, the profile stuff the whatever yeah we're not going to say now extra for privilege elevation or, correct or extra because we're making this file sync no it's we're, included exactly so organizations that might be on one profile solution that are just not ready to move but they're like oh you know i, I like the layering tech well I usually say the layering tech comes with the profile tech. Use the profile tech or not, that's completely up to you. But at some point, you're going to have to justify the cost of why do I have two when I have one product that does all. Mm -hmm. um, and and eventually, maybe you'll let the, the, the platform or whatever profile management tool you're on lapse, or you won't. It, again, it, we're not here to say the way you're doing it now is wrong. We're here to help you fill in things that might be lacking in the products that you're currently running.
Excellent. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I think we're at the top over past the top of the hour. So in uh, in the interest of everyone's time, we'll uh, let you know how you can get some more resources. Uh, we'll go ahead and put a link to um, some of our white papers that uh, cover this topic in the chat window. Uh, also, feel free to go ahead and check out our website or our community. Our community is a great resource for everyone to go to and get some more information from other users and experts. Uh, so it's a great place to go out there with your questions and, and interact and, and look for different topics that you're looking for as well. Also, our customer success stories are great to kind of uh, go in and fill fill some of the gaps and, and see what other people are doing out there. I know Jack <clears throat> has done a great job today of talking about some of his other customers and the things that they've uh, addressed, but that will uh, help as well. So with that being said, thank you both Jack and Jason for today's uh, presentation. Thank you everyone who attended and keep an eye on your inbox in the days following the event for a link to that recording and some other resources. Thank you very much. Have a great day.